Hello, this is Sir Faz Niazi coming to you from Chicago. Hope you all see, keeping safe. Topic is very exciting and very timely, COVID-19 vaccines. You can see in the background, there are a lot of countries still suffering from raging virus and everyone has this hope back that someday somebody will give me a panacea and it will all go away. Let's see if it's going to, going to go away or not. So very quickly, now there are four types, uh, six types of vaccines, okay? And I think um, uh, we all know that, you know, there are traditional vaccines like uh, live antenatal virus, and then there are new vaccines like DNA and RNA vaccines, like Moderna vaccine. Uh, right now, the NECA vaccine and the uh, live attenuated vaccine, the Pasinovac, are the two types, okay, which are uh, the older type. Um, there are many novel uh, elements to it, which I consider to be very positive. I hope that if FDA approves the first RNA vaccine, it will open up a new uh, uh, arena of uh, vaccines that would be much easier, not much, not, I wouldn't say easier, it'll be much more commercially feasible to manufacture. So let's have a small update on where we are with reference to these vaccines, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, the vaccines are considered a new drug and they are developed as a new drug. So all requirements of the complete dossier of a new biological drug applies to it. There's no special uh, consideration. However, the FDA has issued in June a complete guideline on the development of COVID-19 vaccines, which pretty much uh, it, it reiterates what the 351A requires with some specific requirements. Okay. Um, FDA has said that we will accept 50% um, efficacy as the primary endpoint. Uh, FDA is also looking for and has recommended several secondary endpoints. And one of the endpoints was the one I contributed to, and that had to do with um, um, taking a profile of the vaccine's uh, output, which is the antibodies. And we'll talk about that briefly. So all uh, countries are following the same guideline. Okay, and I don't think there's any need for anyone to create a new guideline. I think safety is of uh, biggest concern in vaccines. So don't try to be creative in writing a guideline for your own region, which is different from, uh, let's say the FDA guideline or any other EMA or other guideline, which are also based on the same guidance. <laughs> Uh, ECMRA is a consortium of 29 agencies uh, with WHO as an observer. Uh, if you're looking for advice or how do, should you communicate with public or with clinicians or, the de or developers or the regulatory agencies, uh, go to ICMRA website and you will find some very good advice. I strongly encourage you to do be part of it. Since I said there are many novel vaccines developed I'm sure you know what that means. It may take longer to develop them. On the top right-hand side, I'm showing you a, a, a very nice display of how long it takes to get the vaccines approved. You know, in some cases, it took 28 years to get approved. So when Mr. COVID came in, we decided we're gonna have a vaccine in 18 months. Okay, that too goes into the middle of next year. So for all of you who are sitting here hoping that you will have a vaccine tomorrow, uh, it's not coming. I think it's still at least next year that we'll have any possibility of any vaccine uh, being made available to, uh, to the public, okay. So um, the only vaccine that was approved faster was H1N1, but that was a flu vaccine, which was not truly a new vaccine. I don't know, I cannot tell you what will happen because uh, the Zeneca vaccine, which is a denovirus vaccine, which is not a new modality, uh, was it stopped uh, in US at least, they continued back in UK because it triggered an autoimmune response. I think this is what we understand today, it might change tomorrow as we learn more about it. Now, this is exactly where the safety issue comes with the every vaccine. 
is that if it's going to trigger an autoimmune response, which may take some time years to show up, then you may dis, uh, cause disabilities of millions of people that could have, end up with diabetes, uh, multiple sclerosis, and so many more um, diseases that you would not be able to control. Okay. So I think that the warning is here. Uh, the patience is uh, required. Also, I want to clear up one thing is that uh, I've been often asked if there is an emergency use approval of vaccines, just like the FDA has approved so many diagnostic kits and uh, PPPs and other things, the answer is no. Uh, and emergency use applies to a treatment or uh, uh, amelioration when there's no option available in a life-threatening situation and when someone requests it. To support that, every credible agency that is a company developing vaccines has signed off that they will not ask for any emergency use exemption and also not even ask for a faster review of data by the FDA. Very remarkable. So don't expect any emergency use. And in your jurisdiction, if somebody asks you, my answer will be, no, thank you. But now I have a, a bad news. The bad news came a couple of weeks ago. Uh, my review of this bad news will show up uh, in a day or two, but uh, you are the first one getting it. Or by the time you know you have seen, uh, you see this, okay, it may already be out there, okay. Um, what happens is this, is that, Corona virus enters our brain and they showed significant quantities in the brain that has damaged the cells cause strokes by choking off the oxygen, not by blowing up the cells like it does in lungs, a okay? very different mechanism. But you know, our brain is protected by a barrier, they call blood brain barrier. Nothing goes through it. The antibody you would produce after you Administer a vaccine will not enter brain. Okay. Now that is the problem here. Okay. Now the unfortunately, the virus can get into brain, not through your blood, but directly through your nose and through your mouth. Now we are talking about a situation where we may have the best vaccine, we may have everyone vaccinated, still we have millions of COVID positive tests, especially um, those who are elderly that may have a weaker. Uh, circulation to brain, dying of a stroke. So it's a little bit of cold water on everybody's uh, hopes. We may reduce the deaths by lung um, situation, but not by brain situation. So stay tuned. This may change the entire perspective of how we see the role of vaccines in COVID. The three types of protocols required. One, which is uh, ISINA, you say, I give the vaccine to a group and everybody gets exposed to live virus. At one time they used to do this, but it is called unethical. The second time is that you have a control and treatment group. Um, the treatment group should have less than 50% infections. But here's the problem comes with it. There's no way possible uh, to bring a uniformity between control group and treatment group and how they're exposed. It requires a very large number of subjects, tens of thousands, maybe 100,000, and a long time to complete, to develop any consensus about it. FDA says if it's 50% effective, it's fine with us. So there, are, there is a uh, run for, what are the other protocols we can use, okay? One of the protocol which I have suggested to FDA and FDA is examining it and recommended to companies, is that you look at the profile of antibodies and use the patients who have suffered from COVID as your reference product and the subjects who received your vaccine as your quote unquote, your biosimilar product or your, uh, your test products, okay. So this is what happens, okay. Um, the biosimilarity, Novel approach that I have is uh, you test it in animal species to make sure there's enough antibodies produced. It doesn't matter whether these are relevant or not. 
you're only looking at the response from live virus versus your vaccine. Then you uh, do the profiling of the vaccine, you know, because there are two types of uh, antibodies, IgG and IgM, with a different time profile. Okay. By the way, this is the reason why your complacent plasma is not an effective treatment, is that by the time the patient is treated, okay, most of the antibodies are gone anyway. So if the structure matches, okay, then you say, all right, it's comparable enough, okay. And then you give it to healthy subjects, and then you do in, uh, sampling every seven days and create the profile and match it with the equal number of uh, subjects in the control, which is actual patients, okay. And I think if you do that, you demonstrate high similarity, you may not be able to say that the product is just as effective, but you definitely will have a better chance of saying that this is just as safe as the uh, test product. And this is what happens, okay? You see on the right-hand side, uh, this is the graph of um, how the antibodies are formed. But you know, look at that, you know, in, uh, in about 40 some days, okay? You have a very different profile, okay? You no longer have this IgM antibodies, okay? So the proposal that I had given to FDA, which has been reviewed by FDA, uh, is a very fast track development of antibodies, especially to prove that there is a sufficient safety before you go into large clinical trials. Okay, that's where the, the cost comes in there, the time comes in there. So now there's a possibility, and I'll keep the everybody posted, okay, if, uh, if this becomes a reality to bring the vaccines faster. Um, antibodies that you do are, can be characterized as well known. Uh, technology, I'm not telling you something you don't know, but here's my suggestion how to characterize the antibodies in, um, in a subject who has received the vaccine versus the patients. It has to be done on a timely basis. And uh, when I submitted to FDA my uh, proposal, I think I got a call from this man and say, you know what, let's try it, okay. So he asked me to um, communicate with all the vaccine developers, which I've done. Because FDA doesn't have any authority to tell the developer what to do. They certainly have authority to ask them, okay, what is it, okay? So I'm doing it, uh, uh, relating it. But there's also a lot of politics going on in this vaccine world, okay? You know, the world needs about 4 billion doses. Now, who's going to make it, okay? All major suppliers have taken money from well, US mainly and e Europe. But they have to supply them first, okay? I think the developing countries will be in the back side, okay? They're not going to give them anything. So what is your model for getting the vaccine in your jurisdiction. Number one, you develop your own. Well, a bar of serum is done, a bar of biotech is done, several companies have done it, okay? And I think that's fantastic, okay? Or you, you, you in-license the technology from one of the vaccines that's going to be approved in, uh, in Europe or US and manufacture it locally. But obviously you have to have the facility. They will not give you the technology unless it's GMP compliant. They, want to risk, they don't want to bring risk to their product, no matter where it is used. And then you can just import the vaccines, uh, finished product, ready to go. Uh, but that will take a very long time, okay? One of the country that is um, um, offering the vaccine, you know, is China to anybody. I think they have already promised 2 billion doses, okay? Uh, I don't know if they'll be able to deliver. Uh, you have to be very careful, okay, on company making a promise. Uh, long before they have a proof of efficacy and safety. Um, don't, don't see, I don't see any vaccine coming in 2020, uh, but there is, for whatever reason, business or politics aside. Okay. And I want to thank you uh, for your patience and uh, uh, listening to me, but I only want to tell you to stay rational okay, and don't spoil everything uh, by allowing the use of an unsafe vaccine okay, that can cause so much damage to your entire country and your entire community. Thank you and have a good day.